and uh, welcome you all very uh, sincerely to this first trial run for Odd Sex for the Opus and Digital Seminar in 18th Century Studies. Um, we are very fortunate that uh, Sophie Coulombo has agreed to give a paper so that we can see how this format works and what we like about it. Um, many of you will know that Sophie's a lecturer at the University of York and part of that university's very excellent Centre for 18th Century Studies. Um, you might have read her work on Francis Burney, uh, Elizabeth Montague or William Godwin or Jeremy Bentham and you may have heard her dulcet tones on BBC Radio 3 or on her excellent uh, New Statesman podcast about women writers before Jane Austen. Uh, last year, 2019, um, along with colleagues from Manchester University, Sophie was awarded a, a large AHRC grant for a three-year project called Unlocking the Mary Hamilton Papers, based at the John Rylands Library. And it's that project she's going to talk about uh, today. So Sophie, can I hand over to you? Absolutely, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rebecca, um, for setting up this really brilliant and much needed more now than ever initiative. Um, I'm really pleased to be here for a number of reasons. I'm pleased to be part of the general initiative and I'm pleased to be able to talk a little bit about the project that I'm now spending much of my time on. Um, and I hope that I'll be able to get some, some thoughts and responses from the group that Rebecca has been kind enough to assemble. Okay, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of the project and zoom, tell you what we're currently doing and zoom in on the aspect that I think might be given the expertise of those in the group today of most interest. Um, Rebecca, if I run massively over 15 minutes and you want me to stop, just... I'll, I'll just press come. mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you can just all exit for the uh, after party. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to try to pull up a PowerPoint. Okay, and I'm going to go to slideshow. Okay, can everyone see that? Excellent, thank you. Um, so it's a very basic PowerPoint. I'm usually a bit more snazzy, but for one reason or another, I've not had very much time at the moment. So it's the most basic of basic PowerPoints. Um, I thought I'd start by just giving a little bit of an overview of the project. Um, in 2007, the British Culture Secretary, David Lammy, uh, slapped a temporary export ban on the archive of Mary Hamilton. Um, Hamilton was a blue stocking, writer, a courtier, uh, an antiquarian, and a socialite. Um, she has this archive, this collection of thousands and thousands, hang on, sorry, I'm just gonna pause. No, I've done it, there we go. Um, of thousands of um, uh, items uh, relating to her, correspondence, diaries, catalogues, commonplace books. Um, those were in private hands, um, in the hands of uh, descendants of Hamilton, and they were in danger of leaving the country bound for a US library. And La David Lammy was effectively saying that it would be a disaster for the cultural life of the UK if that were to happen. Uh, luckily, after, after heroic fundraising efforts, the John Rylands Library in Manchester acquired the archive. Um, it's, it's lived in Manchester ever since. So fast forward a decade to about 2017, um, and the collection has been lovingly catalogued by the Ryland's wonderful archivists. Um, uh, however, academics haven't used it as much as perhaps they might have liked, or David Lammy and his civil servants might have envisaged when they slapped this export ban on it. There have been several really valuable articles produced about Hamilton and her archive um, by Lisa Crawley, Natalia Voloshkova, Madeleine Pelling. Um, but given the scale, range and importance of the collection, there's still much to do. Here, I'm just going to quickly pause and show you the um, catalogue in Elgar. Hang on, just a zoom has zoom share. Zoom share. Ah, sorry everyone, I've just suddenly run into a slight difficulty with them. Um... Looks like it's frozen. Um 
it has frozen a bit. Let me try to get back to bring a shared window to the front. What I'm trying to do is show you the um, catalog in Elgar, but I can probably manage without. Have you still got my PowerPoint screen up? Yes, but it's, it's oh, there we are. Yeah, that looks good. That looks okay. good. All right, I'm just going to um, skip showing you the catalogue. Um, uh, but yes, basically what you need to know is um, there's about two, there's 2,520 items in the Rylands. Um, you can sort of get an overview of some of the, I don't have time to delve into it, but you can get an overview of some of the figures with whom Harold Hamilton was corresponding, about whom she was sometimes writing. They range from... Um, uh, various members of the royal family uh, to um, Frances Burney, Hannah Moore, Elizabeth Montague, Elizabeth Vesey, Mary Delaney, the Duchess of Portland, um, Samuel Johnson, James Boswell, Joshua Reynolds, um, Horace Walpole, the list goes on. Um, so she's extremely well connected and um, you know even if you didn't find anything to interest you in the idea of Mary Hamilton and what she did and what she was, um, if you're interested in any of those people there's, there's a lot there for you. Um, it's worth saying that even on top of those 2,500 uh, items um, there are 10 other libraries worldwide that hold Mary Hamilton related material, usually letters, um, in little bits and pieces. Uh, and that's about another thousand on top of the 2,500 at the Rylands. So we've tracked those down, we've obtained permissions to, um, to use them in our project as well. So this is, this is a project of assemblage as, as well as everything else, of, of bringing an archive together almost um, from bits and pieces. And we've actually discovered some hitherto unknown, at least to us, um, items, documents and objects, which is really, really exciting. Um, and we're hoping that we can get hold of them and, and use them. Um, okay, so, in, oh, I've, I've, I'm just going to quickly cycle forward, sorry. Okay, so uh, it was in 2016 that I was approached about this project. David Dennison, who's a professor in English linguistics at the University of Manchester, approached me um, and asked if I'd be interested in chatting about Hamilton, uh, along with his colleague, Nuria Yanez Buza at the University of Vigo, um, he had been using the Hamilton Archive um, to give undergrad students of English language some experience uh, firsthand of using original 18th century documents. Um, and this had led to a good number of over 500 um, transliterations online uh, under the project banner Image to Text. And the more David and Nuria delved into this and did this project with students, the more fascinating they found it, they wondered if there might be potential to develop the pilot into something bigger. Um, so we had a chat, we thought we could probably work together ra rather well, um, and Hannah Barker, who many of you will know of, um, who's head of the John Rylands Research Institute, as well as a, um, an eminent uh, professor of 18th century history, um, joined us and headed us up uh, organisationally as PI. Um, we worked up our application, um, we were lucky enough to uh, get the money, um, and it, I don't really have time to go through exactly what we want to produce, but the main things we want to produce in the project are a first class open access digital edition of the Hamilton papers, uh, which bring them into the public realm, uh, both images and transliterations side by side. We want a searchable personography of people who both feature in the archive as correspondents, but also those who are mentioned, which brings it to another sort of level. Um, we want to produce high quality research outputs across a number of disciplinary fields, uh, papers on social networks, reading practices, forms of address and the uh, development of auxiliary verbs. Um, and we want to um, produce public engagement outputs. We are aiming to produce a short online film, a radio programme for Radio 3, and a programme to engage Manchester school pupils with the archive as well. Um, once we had obtained the funding, we brought our three research associates on board. Cassandra Ulf, who many of you may know, um, uh, she's the reading associate on um, the reading practices strand along with me. Tino Wiedersluis, who is um, the uh, auxiliary verbs and um, 
uh, Terms of Address, Linguistic Research Associate, and Christine Wallace, who is helping us with the transliteration and tagging. Um, so the project started formally in December 2019. Uh, since then, we've all been undertaking training, vast amounts of training, um, workshopping our approach to the technical elements of the project and getting ready to launch ourselves, which we did in February. We are now fully up and running. Um, our website is online, our social media is online. We have been a little bit cursed. Um, or it feels like we've been a little bit cursed. If somebody out there has been trying to curse my first big project, they've done a wonderful job because um, first of all, there were the um, uh, two waves of extremely um, you know, righteous and necessary strikes um, in which I fully uh, participated and with which I fully sympathised, but which did mean it was quite tricky to get ourselves up and running. Um, and then there was, of course, uh, coronavirus, which has led us to this form of uh, digital communication across the board, as well as for this seminar. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit, you know, how are we aiming to carry on this project? What are the challenges that we face now that we have to do things very, very differently? Um, I'll, I'll try and say a little bit more about that later on if I have time. Okay, so I was gonna show you our website, but I will not risk that. It's there if you Google unlocking the Mary Hamilton papers, there's a lot of information up there. Okay, so um, at this point, I think it might be the best use of my remaining time for me and for you to say a bit more about the research that Cassie Ulf and I are carrying out um, about reading practices in the Hamilton Archive. This is one of four strands of research. Um, I'm not going to be saying much about the other three today. Um, there are two, one, one is led by Nuria, and that is linguistic research about terms of address, how people address each other um, in the 18th century in correspondence. Um, there is one led by David, which um, is about the development of auxiliary verbs in the 18th century. Uh, there is one that we all work on together, which is about social networks. Um, and that involves mapping Hamilton's social networks. That might be of quite a lot of interest, but I'm going to park it for the time being because I don't want to run over. Um, but the one I'm going to talk about a little bit now um, is the one about uh, reading practices. And the research question that I devised, put together, made up for our grant application that I thought this archive might be really helpful to answer is this, how can textual traces of reader circulation, reception and response contained in the Hamilton papers help us to think differently about 18th century literature? Um, and the starting point that, uh, from which I sort of launched myself here was um, James Raven's recent remark, um, the most significant and challenging dimension of the history of books remains the particular understanding of their reading. Um, and that was something that when Robert Danton came up with his communication circuit many moons ago, he, he sort of highlighted as the most tricky thing to understand how people actually read. Um, and there have been, um, you know, such, such an understanding would be incredibly valuable. It would help us to comprehend um, how reading, uh, an act of paramount cultural importance has been undertaken, constructed and policed in the past. Um, it would offer us insights into texts, manuscript and print lives and their positions within or outside the literary canon. Um, and there have been attempts made to try to provide the materials to do this on a large scale. So I'm thinking, for example, of the Open University's reading experience database, um, which, is, uh, which was set up a while ago, is still up there, is still helpful, but has sort of um, uh, faltered uh, recently. And, and, and there's room to do something that's more vibrant, I think, and active than that. Um, but there's, there's, there's this sort of dearth of freely accessible archive material that would enable um, scholars to push forward in this area. And the Hamilton Archive is a prime candidate, I think, for this sort of research, since Hamilton, her family and her friends were all voracious readers and acute critics and often writers themselves. Um, and the diaries and letters include a vast array of accounts of circulation, reception and response over a 50 year span. 
Um, and these haven't really been addressed in any substantial way by the very small amount of criticism that's out there about Mary Hamilton and her archive. So that's where we come in. We committed then to detailed patterns of circulation and reception of and response to literary texts in print and manuscript form by members of Hamilton's circle and assess the contribution of social networks to these patterns of circulation, reception and response. So how are we going to do this? Well, as you can see in the bottom half of my slide here, um, the first step is to get the archive uh, photographed. Our in-house photographers at the Rylands have been, they are on pause right now, but have been capturing high-res page-by-page digital images, which they then transfer in batches digitally to our research associates to download and transcribe. Um, I won't go into the technical detail of how we do that, this involves a fancy new thing called the Manchester Digital Viewer, which is very clever and I don't really understand. The research associates then create uh, XML files and edit them in a program called Oxygen. Our XML files conform to a text encoding initiative or TEI schema that David created. Um, again, David is so knowledgeable about this sort of thing and I don't really understand it. I am, I am extremely proud of the small degree of knowledge that I have, uh, but it's not very much. Um, I just say that to preempt anyone asking me technical questions. Um, but what you need to know basically is that as the research associates go through this, they tag the, um, uh, they tag the transliterations. So when they encounter an instance of literary engagement, they tag it as such. And eventually, once that phase is complete, Cassie and I will be pulling all such instances of literary engagement into the underpinning tool of our research strand, which is something that we're at the moment calling the literary database. Um, and this will give us a comprehensive overview of engagements with literary works in the archive. Um, I don't have time to run through really all the sorts of different information that we will then want to capture within that data set to um, perform dis uh, kind of distantish reading, but I'm going to give you the very briefest of flavors before winding up, because I think I'm probably nearing the end of my time. So the three categories that I am broadly thinking about um, under the umbrella of reading practices at the moment, our circulation, reception and response. And um, in terms of circulation, these are some of the questions that we're mulling over at the moment. And we hope to be mulling over in a much more kind of focused way in the future. How do literary texts circulate between Hamilton and other members of her circle? For both print and manuscript, in what ways and with what motivations were texts bought, borrowed, lent and gifted? Do patterns of circulation show any significant differentiation in line with the text in question or the characteristic, sorry, the genre of the text in question or the characteristics of the authors? And we're still narrowing down what those characteristics might be, what it's reasonable and, and feasible to capture. But we're thinking things like rank and gender and whether or not the reader's personally acquainted with the author, that sort of thing. Um, under reception, uh, again, these are some of the questions we're thinking about. How do Hamilton and her circle use texts? How are print and manuscript texts read? Um, is it communal, in a communal, vocalised way? Or is it silent, private, internalised? Um, these are some of the uh, tensions flagged up in Abigail Williams' excellent work, which has been really useful as I go about thinking all these sorts of issues through. Um, is reading construed as an activity of labour or leisure or both? Do patterns of reception, again, showed any differentiation in line with the genre of the text in question or the characteristics of the authors? And then moving on finally to response. This one has really been exercising me. How do Hamilton and her circle respond to the text that they read? 
um, again, looking at keeping print and manuscript forms in mind. Was their reading generally understood to be, and these are just a few ideas at the moment, improving, enjoyable, interesting, educational, moral or immoral, dangerous, a waste of time? Um, is the reading transformative? Um, does it inspire reproduction or recreation? And if so, how? Do patterns of response show those differentiations in line with genre or characteristics? Might these responses be understood as processes of canon formation? And because this is such an interesting archive, because a lot of the texts being read are by people that the readers know, because it's such a literary set, um, how important is acquaintance with or knowledge of the author in determining a response to their works? Okay, I'm very nearly finished here, but I just wanted to flag up that there are a number of challenges for me personally about this project. Um, and that makes it really interesting and exciting and it also makes it challenging. Um, this is the first time I've been involved on a big collaborative grant like this. I'm a relatively junior researcher. In fact, I technically still count as an early career researcher. So it's a great opportunity to be doing this and I'm learning loads from the more experienced co-eyes on the project. Um, but it is a real gear change in terms of responsibility and um, you know, the, the uh, trying to map out what you're going to be doing over these three years. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. Um, it's also challenging in a disciplinary way. This is a really truly interdisciplinary project. I've, I've spoken about my research around as if it's sort of in glorious isolation, but it's not. I'm working with linguists and a historian. I'm, I'm not unused to working with historians, that's not as much of a challenge, but I'm working really across um, linguistic literary boundaries and, and that's incredible and exciting, but it's, it's also, um, you know, it's, it's uh, upward learning curve. Uh, digital humanities also, you know, I don't think I'm digitally illiterate, but I'm not, um, it's not my thing, that's not why I was, uh, you know, approached this project and therefore I'm, I'm having to learn a lot on that front. Um, and just, I guess... I've just yeah. had a, a flag come up to say we've got 10 minutes left, so... Yes, I won't be using all of that. And then we can have conversation. Yeah, I won't be using all of that at all. Um, a slightly, thank you, a slightly different challenge um, but related is, is methodological and um, I haven't really done much distant reading or using big data yet and I'm finding it so weird to try and quantify and classify things that I'm not used to quantifying and classifying like how close Frances Burney is to Mary Hamilton or how emotional somebody is about a text. Um, that's really weird and unfamiliar for me. Uh, and it's also very exciting as making me think in different ways. Um, the final challenge I think is practical. Uh, well, there's COVID-19. Um, it has changed everything. I don't know what this is going to mean for the project. Um, in many respects, we've been incredibly lucky. We've got a lot of our images captured already. And as long as the uh, internet holds up, uh, we can keep doing some stuff, but there are some things we need to do in person and I don't know when we're going to be able to do those. Um, as far as I know, research councils are not willing to extra fund projects uh, ad infinitum for reasons of a global pandemic. Um, you can probably get an extension for your research outputs, but you probably can't get your salary extended. Um, at the moment I'm taking care of a one-year-old as I do this um, who's usually in nursery four days a week so there's all sorts of issues cropping up to do with that. Okay so I thought I would use the last couple of minutes here to throw out a couple of questions to take advantage of this opportunity that Rebecca's offered me to crowdsource um, your knowledge really. Um, the first question I have is about the broad categorization of reading experiences. At the moment, I'm thinking along these lines, this kind of tripartite structure that I outlined, circulation, reception and response. I'm not wedded to that. That's the way I've just created that. Um, I've read quite a lot of literature around reading experiences. Um, for example, there's the um, Read It 
project, which is a pan-European project, um, which is investigating ways to model reading experiences at the moment. I'm in dialogue with them about what they're doing. Um, it's discipline, disciplinarily, again, very, very different. I think it's for sociologists and sort of sociologically inflected historians in some ways, but I'm trying to use their work to inform my own. Um, I've been thinking about whether there are um, recent reinterpretations or updates of com the communication circuit that I should be looking at. Um, but that's, that's one question I'd like to kind of just throw out really. The second question, uh, how to classify genre? So, you know, genre during our period is a notoriously slippy beast. And I have to, Cassie and I have to come up with a way to try to taxonomize it um, so that we can pull out a sort of visualization, a sort of picture of what's going on with genre in a meaningful way in the Hamilton archive. Um, and so these are just under the bullet points. These are some options that we've been considering. Um, do we use modern uh, understandings of genre? Do we use um, 18th century understandings of genre? If so, where do we get those from? Um, and again, I've been talking with some real experts about this. I've been talking with Simon Burroughs and James Raven recently about how uh, we should be doing this. At the moment, I'm minded to use two different, very broad classifications. And those are the categories applied by 18th century collections online as a modern rubric and the categories applied by the Parisian book trade, which is an 18, uh, in the 18th century, which is an 18th century rubric. And I will say more if people want to ask me more about why I'm coming to that conclusion, but they're not set in stone yet. Okay, the third question I want to throw out is, how should we be classifying relationships between people in this archive? Relationships between people writing to each other, people reading with each other, uh, authors and readers, where they move within the same social circles. What sort of categories should we be using to do that? Understandings of kinship and sociability have been so important to our field over the last decade or two. Um, but I'm finding it really, really difficult to um, uh, find a consensus of what categories should apply, even more so because, for reasons I can explain in the Q&A if you like, they have to apply across all disciplinary strands in the project. So they have to be useful to literary scholars, historians and linguists. Um, you know, on what level of broadness or granular granularity should we be working here? Then finally, and this one is the real humdinger, how do you classify or taxonomize responses to reading? How would you even start going about that? Do you think about it in terms of physical responses versus intellectual versus moral responses, what the Read It project calls transformative? And how can you drill down any deeper than that? Do you look at it in terms of favorability on a scale of one to 10? And I know that's, that kind of sounds like a joke almost, like who would do that? What a crass way to do things. But actually in linguistics, that's not an unusual way to do things. And in social network analysis, as I've encountered it so far, that's not an unusual way to do things. You try and rate people on a scale of one to 10 according to how much they like each other. You know, is that something that we can usefully do or is, is that not? Um, should we be look, looking at it from an action focus point of view, recommending, condemning, relending or re-gifting, recirculation? Should we be looking at response through a lens of comparability? You know, where somebody says, well, I've read uh, Miss Burney's novel and it reminds me of, of Richardson. You know, what can, what can we do with that? Or should we be looking at it in terms of how reading feeds into reproduction, inspiration, recreation? So those are the four questions that I wanted to throw out, really. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here because I think I've probably already gone over 15 minutes. I don't want to go any longer. Um, 
thank you for listening. I hope it hasn't been too, um, uh, too foggy or too confused or too much of a canter. Um, we're really excited about the next two and a half, two and three quarters years, um, despite the challenges in place. And I'd be really, really grateful to hear either today or over email or any other media um any thoughts or suggestions you might have for me so on that note i'll hand back over to Rebecca.